Hello beautiful fish lovers and welcome to Puff Daddy Reef. Today we are feeding my pet epaulette shark, Han Solo, frozen in carbonite. So I know what you're thinking, carbonite encased bounties are probably not the best food for an epaulette shark, which is why today I'll discuss nutrition and what this item really is made out of. So epaulette sharks are sharks that live in Australia and New Guinea off the coast in the coral reefs, and they spend most of their lives crawling on their bellies, searching for polychaete worms and crabs, and once in a while a small fish to snack on. They're often called the walking shark because they really don't swim much. They really use their fins like little legs and they're always crawling around. This behavior makes them a really great shark for an aquarium. A lot of sharks are ram ventilated. They need to keep moving to get oxygenation through their gills, but an epaulette shark can actually pump its gills so it's completely fine sitting in one space. Also, due to its habit of living in the tide pools and the craggy rocky areas of coral reefs, it's developed this adaptation to survive for hours at a time outside of the water. Now epaulette sharks really really love tight spaces, it helps them feel secure. When I first got my epaulette shark, he would actually wiggle his way into the crevices of a porous piece of rock and hide. I thought he had jumped out of the tank. If you look behind me at the tank right now, it's a little difficult to see because of the glare, but right under this rock is my epaulette shark, and you actually can't see him at all because he basically stays snug under this little piece of shelf rock all day. That means when do I get to see my epaulette shark? Well, it's mostly at night when he comes out to feed. Epaulette sharks are generally nocturnal feeders or they feed in the evenings and early mornings, and once in a while they'll actually feed in the middle of the day. Uh, but their eyes are actually tuned for low light scenarios. You see that they're little tiny slits in the day when it's bright and when it's dark at night they open wide up. They also uh, use their nose, or it's kind of a nose for a shark, they actually have these um, sensory organs that help them sniff out prey and they also are a little bit electromagnetically, electronically sensitive uh, that helps them zero in on living creatures. So what do they love to eat? This is really important when getting any sort of pet. Um, this epaulette sharks naturally in the wild, they eat about 90% uh, polychaete worms and crabs, 90%. So they don't eat a lot of fish like most sharks. And the studies that have been done on them found that when they're younger, they tend to eat more of these polychaete worms, also known as bristle worms. And if you're a a owner of a reef aquarium, you might have encountered bristle worms. They're a common uh, hitchhiker and sometimes they'll infest tanks, but with a epaulette shark, I really haven't seen any around. Maybe it would actually be a good, good idea if I had some in there for him to snack on. And then crabs, when the, when the fish are later in life, they'll actually eat a lot of crabs. Now my shark has been in here for a while and so far he has not snacked on any of my fish, but you have to understand if you're keeping a shark your fish might not make it. So you need a select fish that you think that the shark won't interact with a lot. The shark spends his time on the bottom of the tank. So fish that are higher in the water column are always a safer bet, but nothing's a truly safe bet. Um, as part of this tank, I'm really finding out what fish are compatible and not with the shark for different stages of life. And so far for the first year of life, all of these fish I have in my tank uh, are compatible. Now I mostly have smaller fish in this tank uh, rather than big fish and part of that is to lower the bio load. A lot of times people will pair other large animals with sharks because hey then the shark won't eat it but if it's a small energetic fish that is high in the water column and the probability is pretty small at this stage in life that they'll eat them we'll find out later on. Um, but another benefit of having smaller fish is that they don't compete with the shark for food. So if I get a piece of food and I drop it in the tank, it's going to be much too big for any of my larger fish to consume. And that's a great strategy to reduce the pollutants in your tank. 
If you look at my tank, I'm actually trying to grow coral in this tank, which was a big challenge for me. I wanted to see if I could do it. Sharks are notoriously messy eaters, but I've taken steps to kind of reduce some of that mess. Another benefit of having only one epaulet shark is that I know that the food that goes in there is he's going to consume it. I can see him consume it and I don't have to overfeed to make sure both animals get enough food. Also, it just gives a little more room in this tank. This tank is five feet long by two feet wide by two feet tall. Now for epaulet sharks, what really matters is the surface area on the ground. So it doesn't really matter if you have like a 180 gallon tank or a 200 gallon tank as much as the amount of floor surface area. Now for an epaulet shark, they'd probably prefer at full growth something more like three feet wide, six feet long. That would be a very spacious, good tank for a full grown epaulet shark. For a shark this size though, he has absolutely plenty of room. And I've designed my structure of my rock work to basically multiply the usable area in this space for him. So if you see, almost all of the rocks are consist of these long plates that are lifted up off the surface of the ground. So this shark has almost the entire floor space of the tank in which to live. And then he's got a separate layer that he spends some time on, not too much, of these higher areas that he can go in and hide. And so far he's really loving it. There will be a point when my shark might need a little bit of upgrade, um, it won't be a much bigger tank than this, but probably a minimum of 180 gallons is a good set, 200 even better. I'm basically going to try to get the biggest reef ready tank I can find when he gets to be maybe about 18 inches to 2 feet. So it's very difficult to go to the store every day to get fresh seafood for your shark. And what I've found is it actually doesn't keep that long. So when I would buy some fresh calamari, maybe keep like three days before it starts smelling weird. Uh, so what you wanna do is make sure you find the cleanest, freshest source of food available. It's okay to be frozen, but it's not okay to be pre-cooked. So one example of something that I found that's really great is this wild caught raw shrimp and it has no preservatives. That's very key. If you're buying farm shrimp from far away places, I found that a lot of those often have preservatives. Look for wild caught, fresh, never cooked, frozen ingredients, and those are what you're gonna want for your shark to make him real happy. So shrimp is a very good one. You're gonna have to cut these up. You want them to be big enough so he can swallow them in one go. And then what I found is that drives my shark bonkers is base scallops. Absolutely loves scallops. So if you're having difficulty getting your shark to eat, I would definitely try some scallops. They're also very easy for them to chew and digest. And it's just wonderful. So I have to say that my shark definitely eats better from them than myself. Another thing you want to consider is you need uh, some sort of vitamin supplement or some sort of vitamin enriched food as another option for your shark. And so what I use is this specially formulated Missouri Exotic Animal Nutrition Shark Gel. And what this is, is it's basically a powder um, that is, it's kind of like powdered fish meal with maybe some sort of binding agent like gelatin and you cook it up in a hot pan and then you pour it into like a tray and it basically cools into little brown jello chunks. Now this is what a lot of zoos and research institutions use. I highly recommend it. You should never feed more than 50% of your shark's diet this. And because we have an epaulet shark and this is primarily a fish based product, um, I would probably err on the side of maybe around 25% and really focus on getting your shark uh, fed with things like uh, crab, scallops, or shrimp. If you can find uh, a good source of bristle worms, they might actually enjoy that. Um, but that's up to you. I've found that they're not sold in high quantities in most grocery stores. <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna get cooking with the shark gel. And once again, this is from the company Missouri, uh, but it's actually owned by Lando Lakes. It's just not Lando Lakes branded because if it was, people might try to eat it. 
And if I give you a look at what it looks like in there, it's just a nice brown powder, and it's got a lot of kick. And by that, I mean a lot of nutrients. It might not be spicy, I don't know. I've avoided tasting it, but when you look at in here, it's basically, there's a one kilogram thing, and it is 55% protein, which is pretty good, and 15% fat, so that's a really interesting combination. Um, and some fiber, 2%, and not more than 16% ash. So, hmm, quite a lot of ash. But what is it actually made out of? Well, it's made out of a small herring-like fish um, called mahaden, and salmon meal, fish oil, then it has gelatin, so that's like the third ingredient, that's definitely the binding agent, then spirulina algae, Wow, that is a whole lot of stuff, and I'm sure that it's great for sharks. This is designed to be an essential part of a feeding system, but not the feeding system alone. So that means you definitely need some of this, but not only this. Um, intake's gonna vary by age, of course, and you can feed up to 50% of the animal's diet, no more than that. I recommend maybe a little bit lower for our shark. Um, never feed dry powder, of course, and just mix it up. So how do we make it? We mix this by weight, okay? So you're gonna need to weigh stuff with 60% boiling water and 40% shark ray gel, okay? So 60-40 mix. I'm gonna adjust the mixture until you have the desired texture as needed. So I'll have to ask my shark and get some good feedback on the appropriate texture of his gel diet. Uh, I'll ask him if it's a little too soft or a little too hard. And do not microwave it. It's very important. That might affect some of the ingredients. Uh, you mix it with a spoon, then you pour it into a shallow pan to cool, and then you refrigerate it until firm, cut into pieces, and feed it to your shark. So we're gonna definitely use the shallow pan method, but instead of a pan, we're gonna use some small Ziploc containers. And to allow it to cool, we're also gonna use these awesome candy molds so the shark can actually eat little pieces of shark shell shaped like sea stars and dolphins and other sharks so he can be a really aggressive one, maybe some worms. Uh, but we also have Han Solo's frozen in carbonite so he can pretend he is a monster in Star Wars chomping down on a last, lost bounty that fell out of a Mandalorian starship. And of course we have the a gummy bear, little frog, penguin, cute animal edition for when he's feeling like chomping down on something a little cuter. So we're doing everything by weight. So 60% weight of water, 40% material. So I'm gonna weigh out uh, this much water and then we're gonna weigh out the equivalent weight of shark meal. Okay, I started with way too much water. So we're gonna change the ratio. We're gonna use 100 grams of powder. So 102 grams of powder turns out to be about 153 uh, grams of water. I'm going to put in a little bit extra water. I'm doing about 164 grams just because some might evaporate. Okay, so now that the water is boiling, we are going to add the powder. Let's add this powder. Alexa, set a timer for one minute. and cooling off. All right. Pop all these guys out. So what do you got here? We have a dolphin. We have a octopus, starfish, little worm with a really cute face. And of course a shark. So you can feel like he's the dominant one. And now we've got little penguins. We've got some monkeys. What is this? A little lion. Frogs. A little bear. 
And for the moment, we've all been waiting for feeding my shark Han Solo on Carbonite. There he goes, unaware and unconscious of the monsters of the deep. And immediately, he's attacked by a purple tang. Purple tang is nibbling at his toes, giving him a nice pedicure. But the shark is nowhere to be found. So we see Napoleon, who doesn't appear interested, so we're gonna have to entice him with something, maybe a little scout. All right, there it is. Han Solo is at the bottom with a little sliver of scallop. And I saw a little nose peeking out there. What will happen to Han Solo? Oh, he has been attacked by the shark. Oh, poor, poor, poor Han Solo. This is it for him. And of course he gets his treat that he so desperately wants. So I'd have to say, overall, my shark is not a huge fan of shark gel. He will eat it from time to time. He'll eat small pieces, but he doesn't go insane over it like he does with the shrimp and definitely like he does with the scallops. But I'll keep including some of it in his diet, hopefully to round it out, give him a little bit of iodine, and keep this guy nice and happy. I'm going to end it with just a montage of sharks destroying different food items I put in the tank for him. So if you like Napoleon and you want to see more of Napoleon, please like this video, uh, leave a comment about Napoleon. I'll definitely be happy to answer your questions. And of course, subscribe. Only about 10% of my subscribers have hit the notification bell. So if you're a longtime subscriber, hit that notification bell so you don't miss any exciting stuff coming up on Puff Daddy Reef. And I'll catch you next time on Puff Daddy Reef. Get to making with Jive Boy. Hey, when it hits you, yeah.